I'm the technical lead for this project uh, called Chapel, which I'll be telling you about today. And the title of my talk is kind of one of, you know, you ever read a novel and you read the chapter, the title, the title of the chapter, and you have no idea what the title of the chapter has anything to do with anything, until you get to the end of the chapter, you're like, oh, okay, now I get it. It's kind of like this title, except I always forget to go back and look at the title of the ch chapter again, so we may forget to do that again here. Anyway, Productive Multi-Resolution Parallel Programming is the official name of my talk. The unofficial name is HPC Programmers Deserve Nice Things Too. Uh, and we'll talk more about what that means. Um, this is a statement my lawyers forced me to make to say you shouldn't assume you can predict the future based on anything I say. Uh, I can't predict the future, so that's good advice. Um, here's the motivation for Chapel. So if you think about when you started programming, remember when it was fun and you loved doing it just for fun? Uh, we hire you into the HPC community, and we sort of give you Fortran and C and C++ and MPI, OpenMP, maybe CUDA. And a lot of the fun goes out of it. So uh, to some extent, the motivation is, you know, why is it? You talk to a Python programmer today. They love writing Python. You know, they would, there's nothing they'd rather do than go write some Python for you a lot of times. MATLAB programmers kind of similarly. Maybe to an extent Java C++, although I think we're starting to slide down the curve there. So the question is, you know, when we work in HPC, why don't we have languages like this, languages that are Productive, easy to get things up and running, portable across system architectures and scales where you don't have to change the code every time some new hardware shows up. Um, and one that works not only for HPC, but also for mainstream large scale data analytics and mainstream desktop parallel computing and things like that as well. And uh, my group's uh, belief is that the reason we don't have this isn't due to any particular technical challenge. It's not like it's an unsolvable problem, but rather we think there's just been a lack of sufficient long-term efforts um, resources put into this problem, community will, uh, co-design between developers and users, and patience. Uh, so the Chapel project is our attempt to change this, to basically put in the time, the resources, the willpower, to basically get over this hurdle and create something nice for parallel computing. Uh, so Chapel is an emerging parallel programming language. Cray is leading the design and development of it, but it's an open source effort, and it's being done in collaboration with members of academia, national labs, international labs, uh, industry, uh, both here within the U.S. and internationally. Uh, it's a work in progress, uh, so it's not done completely, but it's certainly at a point that uh, more and more people are finding they can use it and, uh, and get benefit from it. And the overall goal of the project is to improve productivity of parallel computing. Now, this word productivity is a really loaded term. If you ask 10 people what it means, you'll probably get several different responses. Um, I've gathered together some of the most uh, frequent responses that I hear. Uh, so one of them is if I talk to a recent graduate, uh, say just an undergraduate coming out with a computer science degree or an applied uh, computing degree, um, often they'll say, you know, something like what I'm used to using in school. And often that's a Python, a MATLAB, maybe a Java, something like that. If you talk to a seasoned HPC programmer, like at a national lab, they'll say, that's that sugary stuff that I don't really need because I was born to suffer, right? My job is just to, like, be in pain constantly. Uh, that's kind of my tongue-in-cheek way of saying it. What they're really saying is that they want full control over the machine in order to guarantee the performance that they need to get, right? And that's completely understandable. I'm not trying to actually make fun of that. But there is sort of this attitude like, yeah, we don't need productivity. Uh, I disagree, but whatever. Uh, and then if you talk to a computational scientist, often what they're saying is, look, I'm trying to explore my scientific field. I don't really necessarily want to wrestle with the mapping of my parallel computation down to the architecture. I definitely don't want to worry about porting it from one architecture to the next. Um, so I just want to, I want to focus on the science. I'm willing to think about parallelism, but I don't want to be burdened with the architecture too much. And so what we're trying to do in Chapel is to create something that sort of combines these three viewpoints. Something that gives the computational scientists uh, the ability to express what they want to without taking away that control that an HPC programmer would want and need and implement it in language that's as attractive as a Python or something like a recent graduate would want. A couple quick things about Chapel's implementation. It's being developed as, as open source at GitHub. It's licensed as Apache 2.0 software, so it's a fairly permissive license. Um, the, a lot of people assume when they hear about Chapel that it's intended for Cray machines only since it's being led by Cray. But we realize that a Cray-specific language isn't going to go anywhere. So both the design of the language and the implementation are designed to be very portable. So you can run it on multi-core desktops and laptops. That's probably what we'll do for the most part tonight during the hands-on session. You can run it on commodity clusters in the cloud, on uh, Cray systems, of course, and those from our esteemed competitors. And um, 
we're a little bit behind on things like Intel Phi and GPUs. Um, there's been some experimental work in that area, but on the main branch of the project, there isn't a lot of support there yet. That's something that we're currently working on uh, as those architectures get more and more important and prevalent. Um, so this next slide looks at, uh, historically, the applications that got sort of the first sustained, you know, nice round number, gigaflop, teraflop, petaflop, uh, on a real application. And more importantly, in each entry, the sort of off purple color is the programming model in which it was written. And so there are a couple interesting uh, transition points here. The first is when we went from a gigaflop to a teraflop, that's when we went from simply kind of shared memory vectorization to distributed memory message passing. So you see the MPI comes into the mix there. And then we're actually reasonably steady in terms of uh, programming models between the teraflop and the petaflop. But now, as you've been hearing about for the last several days and maybe the last several years, um, more and more we're seeing these machines that have GPUs, that have Intel Phi, that have these heterogeneous uh, processor types and potentially different flavors of memory. And so when people talk about the first sustained exaflop, the sort of conservative bet, given the rate at which HPC changes program models is, it'll probably still be C, C++, and Fortran. There'll probably still be MPI. And then there'll be some, one of these open things, right? Open MP, open ACC, open CL, or CUDA. Um, and that's a good safe bet that that will be a way to program the exascale machine. Uh, but it's also sort of an interesting time, like maybe this is the time that we as a community should actually start doing something different, something better, something more principled from a computer science perspective. So to illustrate this, let me go to the absolute simplest parallel computation you could write just about. Um, this is a very simple benchmark called Stream Triad. It's basically just a memory bandwidth be benchmark. But it's a great sort of cartoon for the sort of ridiculous pain I think we pay in parallel programming today. So the computation here is simple. We're going to take that vector C, multiply the elements by a scalar alpha, add it to another vector B, and assign that to a third vector A. And as you've done some amount of parallel computing in your life, you'll instantly recognize that this is embarrassingly parallel, or I prefer pleasingly parallel. You can just chunk up the vectors, and you've got sort of nice, obvious chunks of work. Each task or process can take its chunk of the vectors, operate on that subset, and start running. So this is sort of my uh, cartoon for a shared memory um, execution. I chunk up the vectors. They share the alpha. We can each do our piece of the computation. If we ran it in distributed memory, we'd probably want to replicate that alpha, so the cartoon changes slightly. And of course, more and more on today's systems, you have this hybrid where You've got distributed multi-core processors. You have um, shared memories within distributed memories. And of course, with acceleration GPUs, you'll have distributed memories within distributed memories. And you could keep going with the cartoon. Um, so if we look at this computation, it's quite straightforward, as I said. We just want to express some very simple parallelism and some very simple locality, which is you, know, you own your chunks of the vector, I own my chunks of the vector, and we compute on what we own. Uh, so if we look at how you would write this in MPI, the code's probably hard to make out. Uh, I guess you've got your own copies, probably. So here, the red code is the MPI code. There's not that much of it. It's not that bad. And that's because there isn't that much communication in this computation. So you pretty much just have some setup and teardown. Um, the computation itself is down here in the lower right in green. And that's just basically you know, a C for loop with some array accesses in it. And the rest is just kind of C boilerplate, allocation of arrays and setting things up, and so on and so forth. Uh, so not that bad. You know, we could all write this by this point in the course. Um, if we decide to go for that hybrid model I mentioned, mix in some OpenMP, then we could go through and decorate some of our loops and say these are parallel loops. That would give you the additional multitasking parallelism uh, within those loops. And the key thing to note here is that, again, this is sort of the simplest computation you can imagine, the simplest sort of expression of parallelism and locality that we could come up with almost. And the way that we talk about to MPI and to OpenMP, like, here's what I want you to do, is completely different, right? Different concepts, different abstractions, different way of speaking. And there are good reasons for that, but it's kind of unfortunate, right? All I want to say is do this work in parallel. Uh, things get worse when you go to a GPU. So this is the CUDA code on the right over here. Again, the CUDA in this case is in purple. And again, I'm not going to take you through it in detail, but the same thing I said in the previous slide holds here as well. So we've got a new kind of hardware. The way we want to talk about parallelism locality is the same from a computational point of view. And the, the, the abstractions, the APIs, the way that we access that is completely different, right? So the thesis of this is basically that the HPC community, programmers like yourselves, suffer from having way too many distinct notations for just talking about the two main things that you should be caring about. One is parallelism, what should be run uh, simultaneously. And the other is locality, where should it run on my machine? 
okay? And this isn't by accident, and it's not actually the worst thing in the world. The reason we're in this place is that we tend to design our HPC program models in sort of a bottom-up manner. We look at the machine, we look at what it gives us, and we come up with some low-level ways of expressing that, which is reasonable, right? That's sort of how you build stacks of software. Um, the trouble is we then stop there. We don't go and build things above that. Well, I should say, individual groups do, so we hear about groups doing their own abstractions to hide these details away. But as language designers, the HPC community has not really done a good job here. Uh, so what we end up with is, if you have a kind of hardware parallelism you want to target, then you've got probably a distinct programming model for each level of hardware parallelism. And the other thing that sort of goes along with this is that each of these programming models has its own type of software parallelism. So like MPI, for example, the unit of parallelism is the executable. If you had a parallel loop within an MPI program, MPI doesn't really do a whole lot to help you unless you want to spawn off more MPI processes. Uh, so you tend to have to mix and match these programming models as you want to target different types of hardware parallelism and make use of different types of software parallelism. Um, so there are benefits to this. Because these are fairly low level, there's lots of control, fair amount of generality. If the machine can do something, you can probably do it. And they're fairly easy to implement because they're fairly low level. Um, but the downsides are that there tends to be a lot of user-managed detail. There's a lot of differences as to how you program different parts of the hardware at these different levels. And your code ends up being very brittle to changes, both changes in the algorithm itself and changes to the architecture, as we heard about earlier this morning, when you go from you know, a CUDA-enabled GPU to an OpenCL or OpenMP-enabled accelerator. All right, so that's kind of where, why we are where we are, in my opinion. Um, rewinding a little bit, I said, you know, we've got too many notations. And if I were truly honest, I would say, so let's just stop now. But of course, I'm a language guy, so I'm going to say, so let's add one more language, uh, and that's Chapel. <laughs> Um, but Chapel is kind of a nice uh, contrast to these other ones. So this is the entire code. This is probably one of the few versions that you could actually read. This is equivalent to those other codes that we saw. And one of the really cool things about this Chapel code is that um, depending on how I, well, depending on a little detail here that I've elided, I could make this a serial code, a shared memory parallel code, a distributed memory parallel code, a hybrid code, an accelerator code. And it's basically all done through this, this clause here that I've omitted a little bit of detail on, but not like pages and pages of code or anything like that. Kind of an expression or two. This is the special sauce. This says, here's a set of indices. Here's how I want you to map them down to the hardware. And based on that, that's going to say how you should allocate my arrays, how you should compute on those arrays. It basically implies all of the semantics for mapping the logical algorithm you're trying to execute down to the machine. Um, so this is kind of a teaser. And over the course of the lecture, we'll build up to the point where we get back to this point again. Um, but this is sort of to hook your interest a little bit. And the philosophy we're taking here is that if you design a language well, you can take the things that a programmer should care about, parallelism and locality, and tease those away from the algorithm such that the computational scientist, the computer scientist, the compiler, and the runtime can all focus on the things that they're best at without kind of all getting in each other's way all the time in the code. All right? And that's the motivation for Chapel. Uh, so the way this talk's going to go is I'm going to give you just a little bit of kind of some of the themes that we used in designing Chapel. Then I'm going to give you a really quick tour of some of Chapel's concepts. And at the end, I'll wrap up with a little bit about uh, the project status and where we're going and things like that. And then again, this evening after dinner, we'll have a hands-on session. Uh, probably about an hour you'll have to play around with Chapel. Uh, hopefully get something up and running and, and, and get a sense of it. So when I talk about Chapel's motivating themes, this is sort of like, you know, somebody asks you to design a language, you're starting from a blank sheet of paper, what kind of things do you use to decide whether something should be in the language or not? And these are the five themes that I usually talk about. Um, in the interest of time today, I'm going to actually cut some corners and only talk about every other theme, but the other two will come up as we go along, and I'll point them out as, as they do. The first theme we've actually already pretty much talked about, that is this notion of, like, why do we have to mix all these different programming models just to use different types of hardware or software parallelism? And so in a sense, the chapel answer here is, well, you shouldn't have to. You should be able to take that middle column in this table and just say, well, you can use chapel for all of these different types of hardware parallelism or software parallelism. Um, and that's sort of the generality argument. If you have a parallel algorithm in mind, some parallel hardware you want to target, you ought to be able to do that in chapel. You shouldn't hit a point where you said, well, chapel was good for x, but now that I do, want to do y, I guess I have to go back to MPI plus CUDA or whatever. OK, so that's the first thing, pretty simple. Um, the third theme is the, one of those terms that showed up in the title, which probably didn't make much sense, and that's this notion of multi-resolution design. And the concept here, this is some motivation for it, I guess. Um, I've been arguing that all the program models we use today in HPC are pretty low level, pretty close to the hardware. Um, and again, my reaction to that is sort of when I use them for a while, 
man, why is this so tedious and difficult? Uh, why don't my programs port trivially when the hardware changes? Things like that. And it's not that those are the only models that HPC has ever come up with. Um, we have had higher level models. Uh, a couple that were near and dear to my heart uh, from the 90s are High Performance Fortran and ZPL. These are both nice data parallel array languages, and they did some things very nicely, and then other things they were completely useless for. And the problem here was that these high level abstractions took you away from the target machine and insulated you from a lot of those details. But then when those abstractions failed you, you were kind of stranded. You were sort of up above the machine. There was no way to get down and sort of exert more control to you know, express something that the language couldn't express, right? So that pretty much caused them to be dead ends linguistically. Um, so we wanted to chapel out of those experiences. We said, well, we need to address this problem. And so the multi-resolution concept is, is our answer to that. The idea is that the language has multiple tiers of features, some of which are low, lower level, more explicit, more control oriented others of which are much higher level, much more abstract, much more kind of intention oriented. And the idea is that um, you can move between these levels sort of from one function to the next or one statement to the next in your program. Uh, it's not like you have to throw a big switch and end up on one side of the wall or the other. And in fact, the higher level features in the language are actually built in terms of the lower level features of the language, and that's what guarantees that they're all interoperable. So we'll see some examples of this later on, but it, again, the multi-resolution design idea is the idea that one language can be both high level and low level, you don't have to pick one or the other. <clears throat> and the last theme we've actually touched on a bit already uh, in the motivation, which is, um, again, sort of you talk to students coming out of school, not necessarily with HPC background, but you want to hire them into HPC. Well, what do you know how to program? Well, Python, Java, MATLAB. OK, well, you know, again, here's Fortran and C, C++, MPI. There's a big disconnect there. We'd like to narrow that gulf, um, both to utilize these skills of these students that are graduating so they don't end up you know, having all this great knowledge that we can't use in HPC, but also taking advantage of, I mean, languages have gotten better as they've gotten more modern, and HPC is sort of still stuck back in the, when do you want to call it, 80s? Uh, so we'd like to sort of learn from the languages, what have they done well, and bring those into an HPC context. All right, so those are the motivating themes. And next one I'm going to do is give you a brief survey of Chapel. Uh, now, this is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind tour. Um, I can easily give a day-long tutorial on Chapel, and I've got about 40 minutes left. So this will give you sort of a flavor of the language, but it won't give you sort of complete knowledge of the language. So rest assured that if you don't see something here, it doesn't mean it's not in there. Uh, it just means there wasn't enough time. And for the point of this presentation, I'm going to sort of divide these tiers of the language that I mentioned into sort of lower-level Chapel and higher-level Chapel. And we'll start at the lower level and work our way up. Um, so in particular, I'm going to start with the base language. And the base language you can think of as being, if you took Chapel and you removed all the features related to parallelism and all the features related to locality or scalability, uh, it's sort of the language that you'd be left with. So it's like the serial base of the language. Um, but, uh, so you can think of it as like the C or the Fortran of Chapel, except that rather than extending C or Fortran, uh, it's a language from scratch, although it borrows a lot from those languages and others as well. Uh, so just to give you a flavor of the base language, one of the key features in the language is that we have support for static type inference. So if you look at this code, you won't see any declarations of like this is an integer, this is a floating point, anything like that. Um, you can write your code in that style, so I could give types for every single one of these symbols. But you know, when people talk about the productivity of scripting languages, a lot of that productivity comes from not having to name types all the time. Like, I'm passing this array, and it's still an array. I'm passing it on to the next routine. It's still an array. It's passing it on to the next routine. It's still an array, right? There's some point at which you're doing a lot of typing, which, when you're trying to sketch out code quickly, isn't very helpful. Um, now, a difference between our type inference and a typical scripting language is that all of the types are figured out by the compiler at compile time. So there's no execution time overhead for dynamic typing or anything like that, which is why scripting languages typically don't perform so well. Um, but just to walk you through this, give you a flavor, so in this first declaration, I say pi equals 3.14. The compiler knows that 3.14 is a real floating point number, so it infers that pi is a real floating point constant. Um, next, I take a real floating point value, and I add it to an imaginary floating point value. And the compiler knows, well, when you add a real and imaginary, you get a complex. So I know that quad is going to be a complex uh, type. And this is multiplies my real times my complex. And it knows, well, multiplying a real times a complex gives you a complex, so quad 2 is a complex. And similarly, uh, name is a string, and verbose is a Boolean, and so on and so forth. Right? Now again, I could have put in colon real, colon complex, colon complex, and specified the types for all of these. Uh, but I tend not to do that in my slides, in part to show it off, and in part because it saves space. 
Um, this type inference also applies to procedures. So here I've uh, defined a procedure that takes two arguments. I don't specify the types of the arguments nor the return type of the procedure. And what that essentially gives me is a generic procedure like a C++ template function. So I can call it, for example, with an integer and a floating point uh, value. And again, the compiler says, well, uh, that's going to give me a specialized version of this that takes an integer and a floating point value. It knows when it adds ints and floats. It gets a float out, so it knows the return types of floats, so some will be a float. If I call it the second way with two string arguments, plus on strings is concatenation, so the compiler says, OK, well, I'll create a version of this that takes two strings. It returns a string, and so full name will be a string. Uh, and so that's an example of how you use the, the type inference features in Chapel. Okay. Again, all of this will be um, figured out at compile time. So at execution time, you're not paying any overhead for this convenience. All right, switching to another base language feature, uh, the language has support for range types built in and algebraic operators on those range types. Or, well, not algebraic in the true sense. It's got sort of its own range algebra is what I should say. Um, the range is basically a regular sequence of integers, so I declare a range up here called r, which is 1 to 10, and then I have this little print vals helper routine that just prints out the values in r. Uh, so then I have a bunch of range expressions here that I pass in. If I print r, I see the integers 1 through 10. Uh, there's a count operator which says give me the first n elements of the range, so here I'm giving it 3, so I get 1, 2, 3 out. I can stride, so if I do r by 2, I get 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. R by negative 2, if you have a negative stride, it starts counting from the top. So I get 10, 8, 6, 4, 2. And then when you compi compose these, you start to get interesting combinations. So take every other element of R and then take the first three, gives me 1, 3, 5. Give me the first three elements of R and then take every other element, gives me 1 and 3. And this last one here is sort of a, it's a sugar, you could think of, well, it's not a sugar. It's sort of a cute idiom that I use a lot and then I never explain it. So here I am explaining it. This says, give me the infinite range from 0 to infinity and give me the first n elements of that infinite range. And so this essentially gives me 0 through n minus 1. So if you do a lot of zero-based programming, we find ourselves writing 0 dot dot hash n rather than 0 dot dot n minus 1 all the time. So again, just an idiom. Uh, so these are the ranges. Um, nothing deep here, but the kind of thing that when it's built into a language, particularly if you're working in large multidimensional index spaces, having first-class concepts for these kinds of things uh, can really go a long way to making code much more readable and also giving the compiler more semantic information to reason about. Then a third base language feature I want to tell you about is iterators. Um, when we started the language, these were kind of not very well known or used. Since then, many scripting languages have caught up, uh, so more and more people are familiar with these, but just in case you're not. Um, an iterator in Chapel is not like an iterator in C++ or Java. It's basically like a function that rather than returning a single value, it yields multiple values. So you see this yield statement here. Uh, what that says is kick a value back to the call site, but I'm going to continue executing logically. So you use these iterators to drive loops. For example, this is a Fibonacci iterator. It's going to generate the first n Fibonacci numbers. And so I can invoke it by saying for f in Fibonacci 7, do right line f, and that will print out the first seven Fibonacci numbers. Um, and so again, you see this yield is how I do that. I basically compute the next Fibonacci number, yield that, compute the following and yield that. And then when I fall out of this loop in here, I return, and that's the end of the loop over here as well. Okay. Um, these are the kinds of feature that, I remember when we started the language, I said, yeah, I don't think we need these. Clearly, C++ and Java have done fine without it. Once you start using them, you never want to go back. It's sort of like if somebody took functions away from you and you had no way to abstract your straight line code anymore. But in this context, it's for loops. And an example I like for this is, if you've ever had to write a tiled iterator where you're sort of taking a big array and you're going over little tiles at a time, those are pretty ugly uh, loop constructs. You end up with kind of maybe four de deep loop nests. There are a lot of little off by one errors uh, you can make. And if you don't have a good concept for abstracting that away from your loops, then you basically end up writing that idiom for every loop. Or maybe you make a macro or something like that, but you know macros are kind of fragile. Um, so here I can define a tiled row major order iterator. It's pretty short and sweet, um, and I won't walk you through that in detail. But then I can just invoke it like I would invoke a function in straight line code. And suddenly, I've sort of made my code much more readable. I see I'm doing a tiled row major order iterator. I could change arguments here to get slightly different behavior. I can use this in multiple loops without replicating this code over and over again. And again, if you're doing a lot of interesting loop things, um, these iterators are, are pretty huge. Then the last base language feature I want to show you is zippered iteration. It's a fairly simple concept, but it shows up uh, later in my talk. And a zippered iterator is basically you're just iterating over multiple things simultaneously. 
Uh, so here, for example, I'm iterating over that range 0 through n minus 1 and my Fibonacci iterator. And what that's going to do is just make sure that the uh, matching yielded values line up, like the name suggests, zippered together. So that I say fib is 0 is 0 and fib of 1 is 1, as opposed to you know, having them all be jumbled up with respect to one another. OK? So just a way to run through multiple iteratable things at one time. All right? And that gives you a very quick taste of the base language. Um, let me just pause and see if there are any questions so far. I can't tell if I'm lulling you to sleep or going too fast. Yeah. Do you have objects? Say again? Do you have objects? Objects, yeah. So my next slide is actually all the other stuff about the base language I couldn't tell you about. So there's object-oriented features, both reference-oriented objects, like in a Java, and value-oriented objects, like in a C++, say, in the language. Um, we have tuples. We have the ability to write code that's rank independent, so you can debug your code in a 1D setting and then run it in a 3D setting or a 7D setting or whatever. Um, there's interoperability features, so you can call out to other languages. There's a lot of compile time features for metaprogramming, so you can do a lot of computation and reasoning at compile time. Um, blah, 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 blah. A lot of the stuff you'd expect from kind of any good modern language uh, is in here. Um, so the base language is actually quite large. This is the main place in the talk where I say, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, most of the other areas, you'll see the majority of the features, although not quite all of them. Any other questions about the base language before we go on? Yeah. So you said that the compiler will figure out the, the, um, the type variable at, at runtime. Yes. Then how, when you compile your code, how, you know, if you make a mistake, how, how, how the compiler will figure out? Yeah. So the question is, uh, given this static type inference capability, if the compiler is figuring out the, your code, uh, the types of the, the variables in your code, what if you make a mistake? Um, so it is possible, clearly, to make mistakes where, in your mind, you think that that variable is one type, but it turns out to be another type. Um, and every once in a while, those get all the way through till runtime and cause surprises. But most of the time, what happens is something somewhere along the line breaks, right? You call some operator on that variable that, that is not defined for that type. And um, typically, things will blow up in compile time, right? So an example might be, uh, I think this thing is a floating point value, but it's really a string. I call sign on it. Well, there's no sign function on strings. So you'll get a compile time error saying, like, you can't call sign on strings. Um, one of the things we've talked about but never actually gotten around to is having a mode where you could have the compiler print your code back out with all the type information specified. So you could use that as kind of a way to validate, like, yeah, it did what I wanted. And you could also imagine that as a way of transitioning a code from sort of a prototype stage code to more of a, OK, now I'm ready to be production grade. I'd like everything to be bulletproof and strongly typed. Um, the challenge there, of course, is that when you're using some of those features like the generic functions I mentioned, you're going to turn sort of one nice compact function into you know, many, many copies of that function. And so your code's going to blow up a bit when you do that as well. Um, but the interesting thing is I was really nervous about the type feature when I started because, I, again, I thought, you know, this isn't the main reason that people are suffering in HPC today. But again, it's a feature I wouldn't change now. Um, in practice, it's very rare that someone ends up just completely bewildered about what their types are. And the other thing is, you can actually query the types of variables. So you can say things like, print out what the type of this variable or this expression is. And that's a good way. Of, and in fact, you can even print it out during compilation. And that's a good way to debug sort of like, OK, is everything happening the way I think it is? Or where are things going wrong? Um, so yeah, in my experience, the type inference hasn't been a big source of confusion. Again, uh, one can choose not to use those features at all. You can type the names of every variable argument and procedure if you'd like to do that. OK. Yeah, one more question. Libraries. Say that again? Libraries. Libraries. So uh, yeah, so the question is, what kind of libraries are there? Um, this is, so for many, many years, people said, oh, I really like Chapel, but it's not ready for me to use yet. And now more and more people are saying, oh, I like Chapel, and it feels like it's ready for me to use, but now I want all of these libraries. So one of the big efforts that our team is doing now is uh, porting more and more libraries to Chapel. And when I say porting, really what we're typically doing is wrapping the library. So for example, our last release included um, some of the key FFTW routines. We didn't re-implement FFTW. We just created a Chapel interface down to FFTW. And what we're finding as we wrap, particularly numerical libraries, is that the Chapel interfaces are often much cleaner than, say, the C interfaces because we have higher dimensional arrays and things like that. So rather than sort of passing in all this stride and offset information that those routines tend to require in, in C, you can just pass in the array that you want to compute the FFT on. Um, do we don't have BLAS yet, although we're hoping to get it in for this fall's release. So the next two big libraries we're working on are BLAS and LAPAC. And ironically, LAPAC is further ahead than BLAS right now. 
And the main reason is because the guy who's doing blahs, we haven't been able to get under a contributor agreement yet, um, but we're working on that. So hopefully both those things will be in the fall release. Okay. So let me defer other questions for now in order to not completely blow my schedule. And we'll move on to kind of the, the more interesting parts of Chapel, the parallel features. Um, so in Chapel, we talk about two types of parallelism. There's task parallelism, which is our lower level, more explicit type of parallelism, and then data parallelism, which is higher level and more abstract. And, uh, oops, wrong way. Just to define my terms, because different languages de define these differently. So in Chapel, a task is basically a unit of computation, or you can think of it as a chunk of code, essentially, that can and should execute in parallel with other tasks. Um, so we tend not to use the word thread. We think of threads as being the thing that is on the machine executing the task, but the task is sort of the logical computation that ought to be running in parallel. And so task parallelism in Chapel is a style of programming in which you're saying, create a task to do X and create another task to do Y, or create 10 tasks to do Z. Um, and you're really talking explicitly about these are the parallel tasks and this is what they should do. And that's in contrast with the higher uh, form of parallelism, data parallelism. And data parallelism in Chapel means you've got some collection of data, maybe an array, or maybe just a set of indices, or even a range, and you say, for all elements in this collection, do something. So you're talking less about specific tasks and more about uh, the data on which the computation should be executed in parallel. All right, so for now, though, we're going to look at task parallelism. The very simplest way to create parallelism in Chapel is the begin statement. Uh, the begin statement basically just prefixes another statement and says, create a task to run this statement. And the original task will continue on. So here I'm saying, begin a task to print out hello world, and then my original task will go on and print goodbye. And so because these are two concurrent tasks, I could see the output hello world goodbye or goodbye hello world. I won't see the two messages get jumbled together like this because the right line routine is task safe. So it knows how to print one right line out before the other one starts getting printed. Okay, but I could see those printed out in any order because I haven't done anything to coordinate uh, the tasks or have them execute in any particular order. All right, so this is the simplest way to introduce parallelism into your program. Uh, we call this unstructured parallelism because it has this sort of fire and forget style. You just create a task and you go on and do whatever you're doing. Um, we also have more structured forms of task parallelism. This is the main one we tend to use in practice. Um, this is called a co-for-all loop, and it's like the for loop we saw before, uh, except rather than serial, it's parallel. And in particular, what's going to happen is, for every iteration of this loop, a new task is going to be created. So in this case, I'm iterating over this range 0 to num tasks minus 1. So essentially, I've got num tasks iterations, and uh, it's going to create, again, a task for each one of those iterations. So I've got num tasks tasks, each one of which will be running its own copy of the loop body. The loop body, in this case, is just a little right line that says, I'm task, you know, number i. Uh, and then the other thing about a co-for-all is that the co-for-all statement, the original task that encountered it, doesn't go on until all those tasks are done. So there's sort of an implicit join at the end of the co-for-all uh, to make sure that all the iterations are done before we go on. So again, the output here could come out in a scrambled order. I've got, let's say, four tasks. They're each going to print out their message. There's no coordination between them, so they could come out in any order. But I'm guaranteed that that all tasks done message won't be printed until all four tasks have completed because of the implicit join. Okay. So those are two ways of creating task parallelism in Chapel. And again, this is sort of the low level, like, I want to create this many units of parallel work type of programming. Um, there are a few other task parallel concepts we haven't seen today. Cobegins are a third way to create tasks, and really the only other way to create parallelism in the, in the language. Um, we've got a couple different ways to synchronize between tasks, including atomic variables, which are a lot like the C, C++ concept. And then we've got sync single variables, which have kind of producer, consumer, full empty semantics. Um, we also have sync statements and serial statements, which are other ways to, uh, well, ways to coordinate between tasks and also to squash parallelism uh, within a program. <clears throat> um, but that's the task parallel features in the language. So again, some really nice syntax to just create tasks in your program to execute code in parallel. And now you're creating parallelism. And then the last low level feature I'm going to talk about is locality control. Uh, so locality control is all about, you know, we want to run on large systems and we have to worry about where are things running and where's the data that they're uh, accessing located and ideally make sure those things are co-located to avoid a lot of network overhead. So locality control is all about saying where things should execute on the machine. And there's sort of one key feature in locality uh, section language and that's this type that's built in called a locale. And a lot of people are a little bit confused about a locale because it's intentionally a little bit abstract. But you can think of a locale in most machines as being a compute node. So if you're on a cluster with 100 nodes, think of it as having 100 locales, and you'll be good for the rest of my talk. 
And what the locale is useful for is reasoning about locality. And it's sort of in the, you know, if a task is running in the same locale as the data that it's accessing, then it is local, it's cheap, it's, you know, you're happy. If the task is running in a different locale than the data that it's accessing, then it can still access it, but it's gonna be more expensive because you have to go across the network. So the locale is your, your means of reasoning about sort of what's here, what's cheap, what's over there, and therefore more expensive. Um, so yeah, when you run your program, you specify how many locales you wanna run on. Uh, so here are two forms where I say run in eight locales. What that's gonna do is go out and negotiate with the machine and the queuing system and all that good stuff and grab eight nodes, and then my program will start executing. Within the text of the program itself, there are a couple of built-in variables that let you refer to those locales. So one of them is just uh, an integer constant, which uh, lets you say, well, how many locales did I end up running on? And the other one is more, more interesting, more useful. You get this array of locale values, and essentially this is an array of this abstract type that represents the machine resources on which you're running. So again, if I'm running on eight locales in this execution, my program text will have access to this array of eight locale objects, which represent those eight compute nodes. Um, and the one other thing you need to know is when you start running main, that is gonna execute on locale zero. So in order for you to make use of distributed memory, you have to do something to start incorporating those other locales. All right, so we've got this array of locales, what can we do with it? Well, one of the things you can do with these locale values is you can make queries about the system you're running on. So you can say things like, hey locale, how much physical memory do you have? Uh, and then you know, decide your problem size based on that. Or you can say, hey locale, how many cores do you have? And you could decide how many tasks to create based on that, right? So this gives you the ability to introspect about the machine resources on which you're running and perhaps take different actions depending on what you see there. Um, and then perhaps more importantly, uh, this is how we also move computations around the machine. So we have this uh, concept of language called an on clause. This is another prefix that you can put on a statement which says, I'd like you to execute this statement on some other locale or potentially other locale. So I mentioned that when my program starts running, it starts running on locale zero. I hit this on clause here and I say, on locale number one, go and print out this message. So the on clause says, okay, I'm gonna migrate myself over to locale one, print out the message from there, and then when I leave the scope of that on clause, I come back to locale zero again, okay? So I basically created a code here that's sequential, but it's moving around the machine as it executes, okay? Now this style is actually pretty fragile. You typically don't wanna hard code a locale number in your program, because now if I run this program on just one locale, I'm gonna get an out of bounds error because I don't have uh, that, that element of my array. Locales array is zero based, so locales one is actually the second element. Right, so typically you're gonna write your code in more of a data-driven fashion. You'd say something like, on a sub i j, do some big computation. That means on whichever locale owns that element of the array, I'd like you to go there and compute something. Or another example might be, you're walking some tree or graph structure and you say, on whichever locale owns the left child of this node, let's go there and continue the search, right? So uh, the point here is that the on clause can either take an explicit locale, like, hey, go to the nth locale, or it can take just any other variable, essentially, and say, go to the locale where that variable is stored. All right, so you, this data-driven style is the style that you tend to use more often in practice. Okay, um, so the, the thing I mentioned briefly, but I wanna make sure is crystal clear, is that in, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I think that parallelism and locality are the two main things that programmers like yourself should be concerned with. And in most languages that we program in, those two things are completely intermixed, right? So if you think about MPI, for example, um, your unit of parallelism is the MPI process. And that's also your unit of locality, right? There's no way to talk about locality distinctly from parallelism, right? The process is kind of both those things. And in Chapel, these are very different concepts, as I believe they ought to be in, in any uh, truly productive language. So this is a parallel but local program. I have a begin, so I create another task, but I don't have any on clauses, so it's only gonna execute on my local node. Um, this is a distributed but serial program, right? This is the one we saw where I sort of am walking from locale zero over to locale one, back to locale zero, but there's no parallel constructs in there, so it's still a completely serial program. But we can intermix these concepts. So I can say, begin a task that goes to locale one and prints out a message, and then on locale, begin another task that prints out another message, and then I'm gonna print out a message here where I am, right? So the idea is you can compose these things and get sort of arbitrary mixes of lo locality and parallelism uh, because they're separate concepts in language. Okay, any questions on any of these features so far? Let me just take a poll, you guys, is, are you getting it? Am I going way too fast? They didn't give me that much time. Uh, okay, here's some questions. All right, uh, we'll start here. Can you clarify the difference uh, in, in what's actually these two executed forms. between the order of begin and on? Yeah. yeah, there's no deep difference here. I 
perhaps I shouldn't write it this way because it just invites that question every time. But the real point here is that like there's no idiom that says like a begin must follow an on or anything like that. These are just language concepts that can prefix any statement. So you can put them in any order. You can make a function call and put the begin or the on like you know way down deep in the code. So there's no real semantic difference here. I mean, literally the first one says begin a task locally and then move it over there. And the second one says move myself over there and begin a task and then I'll come back. In practice, uh, the compiler basically treats these the same, more or less. Um, but yeah, th so the main reason I did it that way was just to show that these things can be intermixed arbitrarily. Uh, there was another question back here. On will return after the completion of that, or immediately it will return to the next step? Uh, so on, you're saying after the on, when do I come back from my locale? Yes. Yeah. So the on clause, um, it, it takes a statement, and when that statement is done, it comes back. And that statement, in my examples, you've just seen sort of a single statement. It could be you know, a block statement or a function call. So there could be sort of arbitrary, an arbitrary amount of code that's executing over there. You know, in the nature of making slides, all mine are kind of short and sweet. Um, but yeah, it's going to execute sort of that one statement, as big or small as that one statement might be, uh, and then come back when it's done. And begin will spawn off in the background, I mean, in a sense. Yeah, it begins like fire and forget, right? We spawn off the task, and we keep going. So it's asynchronous by nature. Who maps the locales to the system architecture in a program or the job launcher? So the question was, who maps the locales to the system architecture? Is it the programmer or the job launcher? It's the job launcher. So it's something we do today. Um, ultimately, we imagine, in the same way that advanced MPI programmers have ways of saying, like, the ranks should go down to the system in such and such a way, there's nothing that would prevent one from doing that in Chapel. We just haven't gotten to the point of needing that level of precision yet. Um, so today, it's just kind of an arbitrary set that it's pretty much whatever your queuing software is going to give you back. Um, but you can imagine adding the ability to specify that over time. Uh, but it would probably be outside of the source text no matter what. You'd probably have it in some meta file or something that you pass to the launcher. Is the distribution implemented uh, today anyway on top of MPI, or are you doing something? Yeah. So the question is, is the implementation today implemented on top of MPI? Uh, for the communication aspect of it, we implement on top of GasNet, which is a library from Berkeley that supports one-sided puts and gets which are necessary for languages like this, as well as active messages, which we use for our on clauses. Um, so those are kind of our requirements from a communication library is puts and gets, single-sided communication, and active messages, more or less. Um, on the tasking side, the parallelism side, we have implementations that run over just native pthreads. Um, in practice, by default, we typically use a package from Sandia called qthreads, which is a lighter weight user level tasking layer. Uh, but again, that's designed so that you can plug in any one of a number of technologies that you could run your tasks on. All right, good number of questions for now? All right, so Kathy Yellick's gonna come talk to you guys about PGAS languages, and I'm short on time. So I'm gonna skip past these and just assert that Chapel is a PGAS language, but it's a bit different than others. Um, but the one sl last thing I wanna show you about locality is just a little bit about where data gets set across the system. And it's kind of the obvious thing. Um, it's very natural, I think. So again, my program starts running on locale zero. Let's say that's here. I declare a variable i that's an integer. That's going to be stored in locale 0, because that's where I'm running. Now, let's say I use an on clause and go over to locale 1, and then I declare a variable j. Well, j is going to be stored in locale 1, because that's where I'm running when I declared it. All right, now let's see some interesting parallelism. So I've got a coforall loop here that creates a task for every element in my locales array. Right, so if I'm running on eight locales, I've now got eight tasks. And then immediately within there, I've got an on clause, which says, take each task to its appropriate locale. Right, so now I've got one task running on each of my locales. Uh, and now if I declare a variable like this k, well, each of those tasks is going to declare its own copy of k, and each k is going to show up on its respective locale. Right? So now I have a k per locale. So I asserted that Chapel's a PGAS language, and if you're not familiar with PGAS, you can think of PGAS as being like shared memory style programming, but uh, in a way that you can reason about where things are located. And so the way the shared memory part, or the global address space part of it, uh, shows up is that within this inner scope here, I can refer to any one of i, j, and k no matter which one of these tasks I am, right? So if I'm task, the task running over on locale three here, and I say something like k equals i plus j, what the compiler and runtime are going to do is sort of take care of bringing i and j over into memory so I can add those together and store them into k, all kind of transparently under the covers. Uh, if I'm running a locale, the task running on locale zero, for example, well, i is clearly local, so I don't have to do any communication there, but I'm still going to bring j over to add that to my copy of i and, and put it into k. All right, so the point is, just like in a traditional par programming language, if you can see a variable in your lexical scope, you know, as you just walk up the code text, you can refer to it whether it's local or remote. 
Uh, what this means is if you're not careful, you can shoot yourself in the foot, because if you're always referring to local da remote data, it's syntactically invisible, uh, which we think is a big productivity win. But of course, if, if you're not careful about locality, then you could end up paying a lot of communication under the covers um, by accessing something that perhaps, perhaps you should either move yourself over there or create a copy of it locally. All right? Uh, and that gives you sort of a notion of locality features in Chapel. Question in the back there? Yeah. What if they have different values on different uh, The Ks? Uh, so the Ks could have different values because in a sense, I haven't just declared a single variable K here. I've really declared a variable K for each iteration of this loop. And that's just the same as what you'd get if this were just a sequential for loop in C, say. So there's no need to keep these Ks um, symmetric or co coherent or anything. They are literally, uh, you know, different variables, one per locale, basically. The I and J are sort of coherent uh, by virtue of the fact that um, when variables cross uh, this uh, parallel task like this, typically what we do is we make it a constant copy or reference to that variable. So the tasks in here wouldn't be able to modify I or J. There are ways you can escape that, and you can actually say, like, no, I really want to modify I and J, and I'm willing to take on the race conditions and such, and then it's sort of on your head to sort of keep, keep things safe. If you declare on number two another J and it has a different value than the J on one, and right. on three you ask for J, which J does it hold? Right. So if you declared another variable J in here, it's just like any other language with lexical scoping, where if you referred to J, you just sort of walk up the scopes, and you the fr the the inner J here is going to shadow the outer J here. So there's really no way to refer to this J once you've declared a second variable J here. And again, that's just like in C or any other you know decent language, basically. Um, so yeah, nothing magic going on there. All right, I'm really short on time. Do you want to ask a question? Um, yeah, so if k was an array, yep. and you're on one processor, and you want to get an index of k from a second processor, how do you get that? Uh, OK, the question was, if k is an array, so it's an array, and it's remote, or it's local to you? Um, it's an array, and it's been distributed amongst the processors. OK, distributed array. And there's some index that somebody has, and you want to get that index. How do you get it? I mean. There's no magic. Basically, if you can see that index, again, in your lexical scope, if it's something you can see, then you can just name it and read it and refer to it. And if you can't see it, then you can't refer to it. So there's nothing, it's interesting. A lot of PGAS languages have all these funny rules. And the reason is because they're built on SPMD programming models like MPI, where you assume you're running multiple copies of the program. Here, you should never think about multiple copies of this program. You should think about, I start running my program with a single task at the beginning. And as I hit parallel constructs, I create parallel tasks. But all of the references as to what I can see and what I can't see are completely like traditional languages. If you look up your scopes and you can see it, you can refer to it. If you can't see it, you can't refer to it. So if there's a variable you want to refer to, you need to make sure it's somewhere in that scope or that you have some other means of getting to it. Um, oh, I'm coming up, not coming up with many other ways you could. So yeah, it's basically through scoping, just through, as in a normal language, basically. So let's look at the high-level chapel real quick. All right, so for the data parallel concept, uh, the data parallel section language is pretty rich. I'm going to do this by example, and I'm going to use a Jacobi iteration, which I assume you've probably seen 20 times this week already. So you're all familiar with Jacobi. Uh, I'm going to average my four nearest neighbors. The one thing that I sort of do is I set a boundary condition down here of 1.0, so we'll see that in the code. Um, and yeah, it's Jacobi. So here's the code. I'm going to look at it bit by bit. I start by declaring some configuration constants here, n and epsilon. Uh, when I stick this word, keyword config on here, what this does is give me some automatic command line parsing for those constants. So that uh, basically n defaults to 6, but when I run my program, I can say dash dash n equals 10,000 because of this config. So basically what this does is give me automatic command line processing of, of the ability to override that, the value of that variable or constant. Right? So I can say, let's run this time with n as 10,000 and epsilon as 0 .0001, for example. So uh, kind of a nice way to, to parameterize your program. Um, so here's the key to data parallelism, is these things called domains. Uh, domains look a little bit like the ranges we saw before, but they're often multidimensional, and these ones are two-dimensional. So a domain is essentially a language-level concept for an index set. Um, here, for example, I'm declaring big D, which is 0 to n plus 1, 0 to n plus 1, so that gives me an index set like this. I declare D, which is a slice of big D, 1 to n, 1 to n, so that gives me the inner portion of big D. And then last row, I use this little helper procedure exterior. And I say, give me a domain that's one row and zero columns different from D on the exterior. And so that's going to give me a domain describing these indices here. And when I draw it like this, these look a lot like arrays. But there's no data affiliated with these indices, right? So these are really just index sets, like 
I am the indices 1 to n, 1 to n. But there's no sort of n squared data associated with me. Uh, so we use these both to declare arrays, which we'll see next, and also to control computations, which we'll see a bit later. So here I'm declaring two arrays, a and temp, and I see these arrays should be, uh, their size and shape and indices should be defined by big D. So again, that was 0 to n plus 1, 0 to n plus 1. So I basically now have two uh, n plus 2 by n plus 2 arrays, a and temp. And I say, for every index in this domain, allocate a real floating point variable. So I've got two arrays of reals now, uh, and that's what I'm going to use to compute on. Um, next, I'm going to use this slicing notation to say a sub last row. And if you remember, last row was that domain I set up to describe this last row. So I say a sub last row equals 1.0. And that's a data parallel way of saying, for all indices in last row, assign the, uh, the element of a corresponding to those indices to 1.0. And so now I've established my boundary condition in kind of one fell swoop. Um, next, I'm going to use a for all loop. And a for all loop is like a co for all loop in that it's parallel, but rather than creating a task for every single iteration, it creates some number of tasks that are appropriate for the hardware that you're mapping to. Um, so typically, it'll be like the number of cores or the number of nodes across which uh, the domain or the array is distributed. Uh, so if I ran this on an eight core machine, say, the way I've written it right now, it would use eight tasks. And so here I just do the, the four-point stencil, or five-point stencil. Temp sub ij gets a of plus or minus one uh, divided by four. Uh, that's parallel loops. That'll execute in parallel. Then I do a reduction. Take the inner elements of, of a, a sub d, and the inner elements of temp, temp sub d, subtract those, take the absolute value, uh, and then reduce those with the max reduction. So find the largest value that's changed from the inner elements of a and d. Uh, and so again, completely parallel statement. Then I'm going to assign the inner elements of A back to temp for the next iteration and continue this loop until delta is greater than epsilon. OK, so that's Jacobi and Chapel. Print out A at the end. Um, because I didn't say anything about how these domains are implemented, by default, domains are implemented using the current node's memory. So this is essentially a shared memory program. Again, if I was running on my eight core laptop, it would give me eight tasks whenever I hit one of those parallel statements. But this gets us back to the beginning of the talk where there's this demapped clause. I can apply this and say, here's how I want to map you to map this uh, domain down to the locales on which I'm running. And so here I'm using the block distribution. And it says, block the indices across my locales. In this case, imagine I'm on six locales. It would block it in this way. And then because D and last row were defined in terms of big D, they also inherit that same distribution. So they're distributed in a way such that any given element ij is owned by the same locale in all three of those domains. And what this means is that all my computations are kind of well aligned in memory. So the only place I should get communication is when I'm, do when I'm doing the actual stencil itself, the plus or minus ones in the rows and the columns. OK? So with that one change, I've changed this shared memory, pretty nice description of Jacobi, into a distributed memory, pretty nice description of Jacobi. Uh, and that's Chapel. So that gets us back to where we started, where I said this one little demapped clause basically says, how do I map this computation down to my architecture? And it does it in such a way that I don't have to change the algorithm. I don't have to change the science, if you will. I'm just sort of changing the declarations of my index sets and how they map down to the architecture. And all of the computation and all the data distribution flows from that, if I've done my job right. Now, just due to the nature of these talks, this is a pretty simple example. Um, but we've applied this in more interesting cases like Lulesh, which is one of the DOE proxy applications. As you can see, it's incredibly beautiful and productive. Um, it's obvious exactly what's going on. Uh, the real thing I want to point out here is that these are the only lines of code in yellow here which make pretty key data structure choices, like is this distributed or local? Is it sparse or dense? Is it single dimensional or multi dimensional? And all the rest of the code is science. Um, so when we talk about you know, wanting to separate the computer science, the mapping to the architecture from the science, these domain maps are what allow us to do that. All right, so let's summarize. Uh, HPC programmers like yourselves deserve better programming models, we believe. I think that higher level program models can help insulate algorithms from parallel implementation details. And we saw it really quickly here at the end with these domain maps, where you say, here's how to map it to the architecture. Here's the computation I want to do. Um, we think Chapel can greatly improve productivity for current and emerging HPC architectures, not only for HPC users, but also mainstream uses of parallelism at scale. Um, I've got a bunch of slides here on the project status. I'm going to let you read them on your own time, since I'm out of time. I'll mention that we're hiring, so if you have friends uh, who like language implementation and would be well suited, I think we've got two positions opening up in the next few weeks. Uh, please send them our way. And the last thing I want to show you is just uh, some pointers. So if you want to read more about Chapel, the best thing to read is this brief overview of Chapel paper. It sort of tells you everything you might need to know to get started. 
Uh, if you don't have a very long attention span, these are some blog articles uh, to give you a sense in less time. You know, or you can point these to your manager who never has time to read anything. And lastly, these are kind of the three main websites you need to know about. Our main project page, the GitHub page, and we've got a Facebook page as well. All right?